I want to talk to you about this topic that is um, kind of uh, sometimes misunderstood, uh, sometimes disagreed upon. Uh, it's the issue of tithing. And um, I want to just kind of, I want to talk about both sides of the coin, and I just want to help you understand where we are as a church. Now, the vast majority of you that are here tonight, you know where we stand, um, and you know what we believe, but I want to help you understand why we believe what we believe, okay? Um, over the next few weeks, we're going to tackle topics I believe next week, if I'm right. Um, we're going to talk about what happens to infants when they die. Um, whether it be through miscarriage or abortion or an accident or whatever the case is. Uh, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about the role of angels, how angels, their roles in heaven, but also their role in our lives as individuals. And um, at some point uh, this fall, we're going to tackle uh, the concept of divorce and remarriage, okay? And so um, I just love being able to see what the Bible says about things that people disagree on and just say, well, let's see what Jesus said about it, you know? And um, very excited to be able to do that tonight. Uh, the tough topic, the question that we're proposing tonight is simply this, is tithing outdated? And what we're going to find tonight is that there are some people that believe tithing is outdated while others believe the practice is, is still in full swing. Um, but just to kind of set the stage tonight, let me tell you what a tithe is. You may be uh, new here tonight and you're like, I have no idea what this dude is talking about. Um, so let me, just, let me just get things going. Um, a tithe is basically this. The word tithe literally means a tenth part of something. Okay, so if you have a pizza and you cut it into 10 parts and you take out one slice, that is a tithe of that pizza. Uh, now, generally, we speak about tithe as it relates to finances or money, but in the Bible, uh, it does speak of, of financial uh, means, but it also speaks of the tithe of a grain offering and different types of food offerings uh, that are brought to the Lord. And typically what happens is... Um, in scripture, this tithe is what people bring. It is their way to bring the first and the best of their income to the Lord, okay? So it's this idea that whatever God has blessed me with, I am going to return that blessing as an act of gratitude, as an act of thanksgiving, as an act of worship. And so generally what happens is that when people bring tithe to God's house, um, it serves a number of purposes. So for instance, in Old Testament, in that era, um, it would be for the Levites and it would, you know, be so the Levites could um, eat so that they could have clothing, so that they could have homes. It would also go towards temple maintenance. Um, just the upkeep of the tabernacle and, and the different utensils that were needed for sacrifices. But also the tithe was to ensure that everybody in the community was taken care of. So the tithe, the portion of the tithe would be to serve the widows and the orphans and those who were poor and were without, or maybe they were disabled and they couldn't work, so they didn't have food. Part of this was brought to the house of the Lord, so it could also in some ways be distributed to make sure that everybody was really cared for. And so when we, when we look in the Old Testament, we see three different types of offerings that are, are brought to the Lord. The first is what we call the tithe. And again, this is the idea that when I receive whatever I receive, if I receive $100 for my work this week, I am going to take the first 10% of that. That is my first, that is my best, and I'm going to bring it to the Lord as an act of thanksgiving. So there is this idea of offering a tithe to the Lord. There's this other idea of, of sacrifice offerings, which is exactly what it means. They aren't required of God, but it's an act of worship. It's an act of gratitude to saying, Father, um, you're not requiring me to give this, but I want to sacrifice this just to honor you um, with my life. And then there was this other offering, which was basically called a free will offering. And again, this was not something that was required of the people. Um, but it was just a free will offering that uh, they would bring to say, hey, I want to designate this to the leper community over here. And so they would designate these funds and the lepers would be taken care of. But generally speaking, the tithe is just, it's an act of worship. It's, it's the first and the best of what God has blessed me with. I want to give back to him. And it services the entire spiritual community from very practical means like taking care of, you know, modern day, taking, making sure the lights stay on, but also to be able to make sure that the family of God is taken care of through benevolent needs. So that's basically what a tithe is. Um, but the question is, well, 
why would God require a tithe? And I believe there, there, there are two very simple answers to that. The first one is this, is that I believe that God asked people to tithe because a tithe has historically been used by God to test the hearts of his people. Okay? I believe that the tithe is a test of obedience. God has spoken, will we obey? I believe that it is a test of the heart. I believe that it is a test to say, are there idols that I have allowed to erect themselves in my heart? Um, and I believe that it's a test of our trust. Um, I believe there, there are generally two questions that the Lord asks as it relates to our income or our finances. Number one is this, is do I have money or does money have me, right? Do I have money or does money have my heart? And there is a distinct difference between those two things. And when it comes to generosity, when it comes to the obedience of the tithe, you can typically tell if money has a person's heart or if they understand that money is just a tool for them to use based on their level of generosity. The second question I believe that is, that is used to test us is this idea of trust, where we ask ourselves, do I trust the resources that God has given me? Do I trust in the money? Do I trust in the job? Do I trust in all of these resources? Or do I trust in God as my source, right? Do I really believe that if God gives me 100% and I give a tithe back to him that he will make this 90% make more sense and go a lot further than if I had 100%, right? So it's this idea of trust. It's God testing our hearts. It's him proving us um, time and time again through this level of obedience. Um, I remember reading this story about the Knights Templar. And uh, you remember these were knights who went on the crusades and I know there are a lot of mixed views. We're not talking about that tough topic, topic tonight. Um, but there is an, uh, a legend that says these knights, just before um, they would leave Europe to you know, take the trek down to Jerusalem and they would just you know, carve their way through, there was this legend that says these men would go and they would be water baptized. There's this one story that says there was something like 1,200 men at one time who, who went into the waters of baptism, all to be baptized. Uh, but the legend says that as they went into the waters of baptism, that they would withdraw their sword from their sheath and they would hold their sword above the water. And when they were water baptized, the, the sword would stay out of the water. And they did that because in their understanding, they believed that their sword was going to do some things that God would not approve of. And so it was their way of saying, Lord, you can touch, you can touch anything in my life. You have, every, you have full access to everything in my life except for the sword. The reality is this, is that there are some people, as they go to give their lives to Jesus, they take out their wallets and as they go in the waters of baptism, they say, Lord, you have access to everything except for this. And um, I think that's true not only for our wallets, but I think for a lot of other things. There, there are things that we all struggle with to really release to the Lord. And I think that that is a great legend to help us understand that, no, we, we don't need to hold our swords out of the water. We don't need to hold anything out of the water. There is a full immersion so that he can have full and complete access to everything. And I believe that he asked us to tithe as a test of our obedience to him. Okay. Secondly, I believe that God asked us to tithe because it has been used as a system to support and to sustain the ministry all throughout human history, okay? Uh, you've heard me say it again uh, before, and you will hear me say it a thousand times over the next 30 years, but it has always been the plan of God for the people of God to sustain the house of God. It has always been his plan, and I don't believe that's going to change. So I believe he does it for two purposes. He does it because he wants to reach our hearts. There, there's like a motivation to secure our allegiance to Jesus. But there's also a practical side where he's like, look, the ministry's got to happen. And it can't happen without money. Okay. And so he, he asked the people. He created this type of system. Now, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to talk to you um, for a good little bit about the different benefits 
um, that God promises to those who will honor him with the tithe and with the offerings. And then near the end, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to pivot a little bit and we're going to talk about um, the, basically the arguments that some people have against tithing. And then we'll talk about some of the arguments that we would suggest for tithing. Okay. And then we'll kind of wrap things up. I find it interesting that in Malachi chapter three, now, if you've been around the church very long, you know that this is, you know, if you've ever heard anybody preach about tithing or offering, this is like the go-to passage. Okay. Um, and, and it's true. There's so much here and it's very important that we understand it. Um, but I want to take a step back and I, I want to help us understand what's actually going on when Malachi is being written. Um, Israel is in a desolate place. They're in a place, they're about to step into 400 years where there's no voice from heaven. There's no prophetic utterances. They're about to go into a very dry time. And part of the reason they're going into that dry time um, is because of their disobedience to the Lord. And so what you've got, not only on a civil level, but in, on a priestly level, you've got a lot of corruption. You've got um, immorality that is like growing in the hearts of the people. You've got people that, you know, they may come to the temple, but they, are, they, they may sing with their lips, but it's not in their life and it's not in their hearts. And so their words are like hollow as they reach the halls of heaven. And you have these people, this entire culture where there is a lack of love and a care for the orphan and a care for those who are outcasts, they are actually becoming the people that God never intended for them to come, become. And they're on this, this, this slope and they're sliding down really, really quickly. And what's interesting to me is that in the midst of all this chaos in Malachi, there, there is a lot that's being said in Malachi. But I think it's interesting, and I want, to be, I want to be honest with the text. I'm not saying this is emphatically true. All I'm saying, this is an interesting observation that in the midst of all that God is calling out Israel for, all of their failure, all of their disobedience, all of their walking away, in the midst of God like wooing them and correcting them back, he points to Malachi 3. Like he uses this as one of the examples of saying, the reason you're seeing the destruction and the Persians are pressing in, the reason that you're seeing your crops fail and the reason that there's droughts, one of the reasons relates back to how you relate to me through your income, right? It's really a bizarre, it almost feels out of place. But what you begin to understand is that although this portion we're going to read talks about money, it's really not about money. It, I mean, it says a lot about tithe, it says a lot about offering, it says a lot about finances, but that's not really what it's about. It's about the heart of the people saying, Father, you are first and you are supreme. And as I honor you with my life, I'm naturally just going to honor you with my finances. But the Lord points back and he says, this is one of many things that you have neglected to do. And because you have neglected to do it, now your entire nation is facing the consequences of it. Okay, so let's pick up together in Malachi chapter three. It, it may be in your notes or on the screen. Uh, this is what the Lord says. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere, and the Lord replies, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. So the people of God are saying, what do you mean return to you? What, what have we done to walk away or what haven't we done? And the Lord immediately says, will a, will a mere mortal rob the God of heaven? But he says, yet you rob me. But you ask, Lord, how are we robbing you? And the Lord replies in the tithes and the offering. You are under a curse your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then the nations will call you blessed, for your wills, yours will be a land filled with delight, says the Lord Almighty. 
Now, what I want to do for the next few minutes is I, I just want to break this text down almost verse by verse. And I want to help us to understand the benefits, the, the, the good part of when we honor God with our first and our best. Um, number one is this. The tithe is an expectation that God has for his people. Okay, there is no doubt when you read this text, he opens by saying, um, you're, you're basically robbing me by not giving your tithe and offering to the storehouse. Um, Jesus, later on in Matthew 22, he would kind of reiterate this. You remember the Pharisees come and they try to like trick him in a moment. And Jesus, they ask him about his tax money and all this kind of thing. And Jesus replies with such incredible wisdom. He says, look, give to Caesar what Caesar's. In other words, if you live in a land and they require you to pay taxes off your income, pay your taxes, right? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. But then on the flip side of that, he says, but also give to God what is God's. So in other words, he's saying, listen, yeah, you got to pay your taxes, but your government, although they may be an authority over you, they are not the supreme authority over you. And Jesus is making the statement, it's kind of backwards that a person may pay this level of authority, but not give worship and honor through their finances at this level of authority. And so he's saying, no, give it at this level because you need to, and give it at this level because it's what God has called you to do. And so it is an expectation um, for his people. Finances is simply this. It is a matter of stewardship, okay? It's important for us to understand that every dollar in your bank account is not your dollar, Every check that I have is not my check, okay? Everything that I earn is not really what I've earned. I would not have the ability to earn anything lest God gave me the ability to earn anything. I wouldn't have the opportunity to have income unless God had presented an opportunity for me. We are mere stewards. We are conduits. We are managers. And God has said, look, I'm the owner of it but I am going to give you some and see how you manage it. Now, I want you to do some things in the way that I'm calling you to do them. R.T. Kendall says it like this. He said, we give God the tithe, but it's really just returning what's his, right? So it's not really, I mean, we say it, Lord, we're sacrificing and we're giving you this. And I understand it, it is a sacrifice, but I'm just saying we make it out to be this thing where it's like I, I am taking a piece of me and giving it back to you, Lord. And in some ways, maybe that's true, but it was never really ours to begin with, right? It's the God of heavens, and he, all we're doing is returning it back to him because he has been so good and generous to us. And so um, I think it's important that, that the Lord, we, we understand that the Lord has financially blessed us so that we can manage those funds according to his will. That begins with tithing, that begins with offering, that begins with paying our bills, that begins with paying taxes. It, these, these things are within the will of God that we should manage these things well, okay? So it is an expectation that God has because he says to the people that do not tithe, you're robbing me, okay? Uh, pretty big expectation. Number two, the tithe withheld from God removes the blessing of God, okay? Now, the Lord has some pretty strong words, okay? Now, again, I want to I wanna make sure I'm honest with the text. He is specifically talking to Israel in this moment, okay? So I don't want to overstate anything, but it's important anytime God speaks to his people, whether it be Israel a thousand years ago or if he's speaking to us today, when, when the word of God speaks, he is revealing how he feels about things, Okay, even if they are under the old law, there are certain things that we no longer have to live by, but written in the text of God, it, it helps us understand, well, this is really what his heart is, okay? And so it's important for us to understand that, that I know that he was talking to a specific people in a specific time, but his words were very harsh for these people. This is what he said. He said, you are under a curse, the whole nation, because you are robbing God, okay? Now, the question comes about, well, if I don't tithe, does God curse me because of it, okay? And 
I just simply want to say this. The tithe, we do not view the tithe like we're paying off God. Like, please don't do anything bad to me, you know, and just take my money, take the money and don't, don't hurt me. That is, that is not what the tithe is about. You've got to remember that in, in this moment, God is speaking about the tithe, but there is a whole lot going on in their nation, okay? The, the tithe is just one part of their rebellion against the Lord. And I'll simply say this. I, I don't know that, that I can embrace this idea that God curses our finances, um, especially as the children of God. But what I do believe is that the removal of blessing is the same as a curse, right? So whether it's a curse on your dollar bills or the lifting of God's hand off your dollar bills, I would consider that kind of in the same ballpark, okay? Um, it's basically when we withhold what God has asked us to give, we are basically keeping something that doesn't belong to us. This is the whole issue in the garden, right? The Lord said, look, don't touch the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. It's not yours. It's just something like, let me hold this to myself. I'm going to put it in your midst, but just let, let me take care of that. You don't mess with it. Adam and Eve could not refrain from it. So they went and they took something that was not theirs to take right? And we saw the fallout from that, okay? Now, uh, again, I want to I wanna, I wanna make sure I make this very, very clear. Um, I do believe that God can, I do believe that God does withdraw his blessing at times um, when, when we walk in, you know, willing disobedience and, and rebellion. I do believe that he will do that. But I want to remind us that giving should never be motivated by fear or guilt or manipulation or anything like that. Our giving should always be motivated by the promise that God loves us, that he cares for us, that he wants to take care of us, but we also understand that we have to allow him to take care of us, right? And sometimes that means releasing things and allowing him to do what only he can do. So it should never be motivated by this idea of, you know, God is going to do this horrible thing. Um, it shouldn't be motivated by that. It should always be motivated by love. Um, but there is a reality that God at times will remove his hand of blessing if we choose to rebel. Okay. Number three, um, it's important to understand that the tithe is a full 10%. Okay. Okay. Um, this is in the text, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Okay. Um, again, tithe being a 10th or 10%, however you want to, you want to label it. Um, I have listened to pastors whom I, I deeply admire. I deeply respect. Um, I have heard them say things like, well, um, tithe what you can, or if you can only tithe five percent, then just start there and grow your way up. And I understand what they're saying. I don't want to belittle that or any stretch of the imagination. I don't want to to disrespect that. But what they're saying is nonsense. They're saying bring five percent of ten percent. You know what I mean? Like it's this whole a tithe does not go with another type of percentage. A tithe is a tenth. Okay. And this is what God asks when he says, listen, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, okay? Um, so it's important that, that we understand that. Number four, it's also important that we understand that uh, a tithe is a partnership with the God of heaven, okay? He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, and this is why, that there may be food in my house, okay? Okay. I think, I think one of the greatest things that people miss out on, people who love Jesus, you know, and just for whatever reason, they can't, they can't bring themselves into a submissive place with their finances. I think one of the greatest things that they miss out on is not just the blessing that God showers on them financially, but I think they miss out on the partnership of doing what, what, what God does through their resources there is a partnership, and I think, I think far too many people don't understand that there is a reward attached to that, a heavenly reward that will far exceed any dollar amount that you can ever imagine on this planet. There is a partnership. Every dollar, like uh, I'm just going to take Christian life for example. Every, every time you give a dollar, you, you know, that may be going to VBS or that may be going, that'll reach 200, 300 children. Some children that will never hear the gospel in their lives that we bust in from, you know, really uh, low, difficult income areas. 
Um, it may be going to our local missions or our food pantry, or it may be going to you know, global missions or whatever the case is, or helping life group leaders with curriculum, or it may be you know, helping keep the lights on or the AC going in August. There, there are so many different things, but my point is simply this. There is a ministerial partnership where, where when we give, there, there is a partnership that it's not just the church that's divvying out how these funds will be spent. There is a supernatural connection with every, every penny that we give, and God will reward that. And here's the thing. I believe this. I believe that when we get to heaven, uh, you guys listen to me. It's going to be for eternity, right? There's a lot, like there's so much time. I believe that there will be a moment where God will take through our lives and he will show every time that we gave or every time that we serve and he will show us the ripple effects that that ministry had or that generosity had on people for generations to come that we had no earthly idea was even possible. I believe that God is that good that he will show us all of that because we chose to be in partnership with him. Okay, um, I love this, uh, this quote. I could not find the originator of this quote, so I'm going to take credit for No, I'm kidding, I'm not. But uh, I, couldn't, I, I can't find the originator of this quote. But this is, this is what one person said. They said, giving isn't just a way of raising money. It is a way of raising men. Meaning this, that giving is a part of discipleship. It is, it is us understanding our place in the kingdom, our role in the kingdom, our value in the kingdom, the importance of what we do for the kingdom purposes. And so again, this is why we don't hold things out of the water, right? We say, Father, full access. You have full access here because we want to sow so that ultimately we also may reap, but so others may reap as well as we give, okay? So there is a partnership. There's such, oh man, please don't miss out on the partnership of serving, of loving, of giving, of so many different things. Um, your, your investment in prayer is a partnership. And I believe that God's gonna reward us and, and show us all the impact that those things have had. Number five, uh, the tithe reveals God's commitment, not only to us, but to his word, okay? Um, you realize this is the only time in the entire text out of 66 books, okay, this is the only time where God says, test me, right? Now, I'm going to say this. It's a bold move to test the creator God, okay, because he's not only the creator, he is also the destroyer when he wants to be, okay? But it is a bold thing to say, well, I'm going to test God in this, but this is the only time in Scripture where he's saying, listen to me, if you don't believe me, why don't you test me in this? Put me to the test and see if I don't stand true to my name. And I promise you this, he will not be made a liar. He will not be made a liar. Um, so there, there is a moment where he's not only um, um, uh, showing us his commitment to us as we obey, but his commitment to his very own word. Number six, very quickly, the tithe unleashes supernatural blessing. Verse 10 says, this is the Lord speaking, he says, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it, okay? Now, I do want to say this. There is this element of blessing, and I know people say, well, we don't give to get, and I absolutely emphatically agree with that, but I will say this, that in the text, the Lord gives us incentives to give, and one of those is being a recipient of his blessing, okay? Um, I don't think that we should love other people or do good things to other people so that we will get a reward in heaven. But when Jesus speaks to us, he says, hey, do these good things so that you can get a reward in heaven. So God isn't against incentives. I'm just saying that I don't think that can be the motivation of our heart, okay? I, th I think it's a part of that. But our motivation always needs to be birthed from love. But I'm simply saying that God will pour out his supernatural blessing over us. And it's okay to be okay with that. It's okay to receive that. It's okay as a child to receive from the Heavenly Father and allow him to do that. But I do want to say this, that sometimes God pours out his supernatural blessing in a way that we may not have thought or 
there have been times where I have had to try to identify, oh, this is the hand of the Lord. This is how God has poured out his blessing when it isn't super obvious to me in the way that, that he has chosen to do that, okay? So I'll give you an example. I, 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 think that it's, I think that God's supernatural blessing as a response to our obedience to generosity, I do not think it's as much about comfort for us, like his blessing is much about comfort as it is about destiny, okay? Now I wanna give you a, a, just a quick story here. Um, when my wife and I, we have two biological children and three adopted children. And um, adoption is incredibly expensive, okay? I don't want to get too personal, but you need to know the numbers for the story, okay? Um, each adoption is, is well over $40,000, okay, in the, in the low to mid-40s. And um, during our second adoption, I remember um, when I came to my wife, um, we were talking about this and we were, we were coming to a place of agreement that we were going to uh, proceed with the adoption. We had just come out of the first adoption. Like, and, and basically all of our adopted children, they had the same birth mother, okay? And what had happened is after Ella was born, 15 months later, Emery was born. 15 months, dude. Like that was quick, okay? And when, when we were pursuing adoption with Ella, um, man, we had such incredible support. We had incredible support throughout every adoption. I want to, I want to be clear and say that, but during the first adoption, there was a rallying like I had never seen in my life from friends, family, church, everything. The support system was so strong and powerful. And I remember when my wife and I were coming to an, a point of agreement to adopt our, our, um, our Emory, I remember I sat with my wife and I said, now we're going to do this, but I need you to understand this. I need you to understand that the level of sacrifice we're about to undertake is far greater than the first sacrifice with, with Ella because just the natural, the way that we all are as people, um, it's super easy to rally around a one and done kind of, woo, let's go, take the hill kind of thing. But 15 months later, like, it's like, whoa, you know, I'm a little weary right now. Give me, give me a few more months before I start contributing again. And I just told her, I said, we're going to have to sacrifice financially far more than we did the first time. And so um, we found out about Emery very, very late. I mean, she was born 15 months later. I think we found out about her 12 months later. Okay, so um, we had three, less than three months to prepare financially. And uh, the way that the, the system works, like you, you don't show up, there aren't payment plans, you pay or you can't adopt, okay? And um, I remember we were, we were less than two months, I think, it was, I think it was like 40, 45 days or something like that, away from when Emory was born. And we were on a vacation to see our family down in Florida. And I remember we, we were driving down the road and we were like $35,000 short and we had 45 days and we had touched every well that, that there was. And um, we got to the point where I was like, okay, well, I'm about to have to empty my 401k, uh, my retirement, so that we can do this, but that's still not going to get us there. It's not even going to be close to getting us there, you know? And... Um, I remember we were driving down the road and all of a sudden, uh, out, of, out of nowhere, my, my wife gets this message on Facebook. And it's this lady that we know, we don't know her well, but we know her, right? She's a friend of Joy's mother and uh, lives in like Pennsylvania, something like that. And uh, she reaches out. We never talked to her on the phone. She says, hey, would you, would you be willing to give me a call and talk to you? And so Joy calls her. We're in the car. I remember where we were. You know, it was one of those moments. And uh, so they had this conversation. She's asking about the adoption, all this kind of stuff. She says, listen, I just, you know, I, I, I care for you guys so much. And I'm, I, I want to be, I, I want to partner with, with what you're doing. She said, I'm, I'm, I'm sending a check to you today for $10,000 towards the adoption. And I was just like, holy shnikes. Like, I, that is just like mind-blowing, amazing. And, um, you know, we're like weeping. We're like, we've never had anybody give us $10,000 for anything, you know. Um, and so we get on the phone. We're giving thanks. We're so grateful. And I think, it was, I think it was the next day. It may have been two days later. The next day, I remember where we were. We were at my sister's house. And she gets another phone call from this lady. And this lady says, listen, I love you all so much. And she says, you know how much I care and I want to be a part of this. And um, she says, how much do you owe on the adoption? And Joy kind of did the math. She said, well, after you're 10, we probably owe like 25. 
And the lady said, I'm sending another check for 25 in addition to the 10. And um, of course, Joy's like, no, 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 you, you can't do that. You can't do that. All this kind of thing. And this is what the lady said. She said, Joy, I appreciate your heart. I know what you're trying to say. And I, I do that. And I want you to know I love you. But this has far less to do with my love for you. And it has far more with me being obedient to what I feel like the Father has spoken to me. Right? So, yeah, she was moved with compassion for us. But it was the voice of the Father that led her to do this and to bless us in a very supernatural way that was very, very unexpected, right? Because in my mind, I'm like, Lord, as I'm faithful to tithe, maybe I'll get a raise or maybe I'll get, you know, a, a side hustle or, you know, whatever the case is, maybe I won't have a car payment anymore or whatever the case is. But it's like in this moment, I saw the faithfulness of God in such an incredibly powerful way. You know what I'm saying? And I believe that that was just one of those moments where the Lord is showing himself mighty and he's showing himself strong. And he's saying, Corey, you and Joy have tested me in this. And, and you know, and, and we're not perfect, but, but generally speaking, you have been faithful in this. And I'm going to show myself so strong to you in this moment. And he did. And she sent both those checks and we cashed both of them. Okay. And um, we were able to bring Emory home the day that we arrived. We went to the hospital, we got her and we took her home. It was, it was an incredible thing. I simply say that to say that when God supernaturally pours out his blessing, it's not always about our comfort. It's not always about a new vehicle or a new home or a new lazy boy or whatever the case is. It's not always about that. And sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's about the destiny that's attached to our lives, right? And um, I believe for us in that situation, Emory is a part of our destiny. And um, I believe that's how God showed himself faithful to us. The most, the most like, simplistic way I can put it is simply this. You can never outgive God. He, he won't let you. you. He won't let you because he will not be made a liar by man. You cannot outgive God. He will make a way for you. Okay, number seven, not only does the tithe unleash supernatural blessing, but the tithe establishes protection around our current resources. Okay, um, this is, listen to what the Lord said to Israel. He said, when you turn and you begin to obey, he says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops. Now crops for the people of Israel, that was food and income right? And he said, right now, the, the, the anteater, like, they're getting after it, right? They're destroying your crops. You're not able to bring in. You're not able to sell. You're not able to eat. You're not able to do this because of all this. But when you turn and you put me first, I am going to turn them away and they can go eat something else, but they will stay away from your crops. And in that way, what God is doing is he is protecting their current resources from destruction. Okay. Now I, I want to, I want to say this. Um, Tithing doesn't preserve us from hardship or consequences from bad decisions, okay? Like if you have $477,892 of visa debt, okay, that's not the Lord's fault that he didn't rescue you out of that, okay? Maybe you weren't being a good manager of it. That's not God punishing you or him not doing his part, and that's just a part of our management. That's a part of our stewardship. And so we, you know, this, again, this isn't like a, we're paying God off to do something to get us out of bed. That's not what this is about. This is about honoring the Lord and receiving his blessing because our hearts are geared towards him. It is not about avoiding hardship. It is about the assurance that he will sustain us over the long haul, Okay. Um, and so the tithe establishes a, a type of protection around our resources. Number eight, the tithe also places favor on the efforts that, that we make, okay? Uh, the Lord said to the people of Israel, he said, the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe. So in other words, not only were their crops being eaten by locusts and bugs and all this stuff, but their crops were like prematurely falling off the vine and, you know, they're not edible and they, they have to do away with them. The Lord says this, I will give you favor so that those will stay on the vine until they're ready, right? So there's a favor that comes from the Lord. I want to say that this is not pragmatism. 
This is not, we, we do this because it works. We tithe because we know that God is going to get, that, that's pragmatism, I think in a lot of ways that is anti-God, okay? That is trying to formulate a system and like it becomes about prosperity. That is not what this is about. This is about fruitfulness. This is about love for God. This is about putting God as a Lord and Savior and giving him my allegiance in my life. And as I do that, he puts a favor on my life. When I was 19, Joy and I got married, she was 20, okay? And she will never be able to live that down. She was a cougar. And I married her when she was a little bit older. Um, and we, we had a, a child before our second wedding anniversary, okay? So we were young, young family just getting started. And I had no formal education. I was a recent Christian. I got saved when I was 18. So I was just growing in my relationship with the Lord. And we were serving at a local church. And I was just trying to grow in discipleship. And I had a job. I worked for AT&T. And um, through the course of time, um, uh, the Lord promoted me. I mean, I was faithful to do the work, but it was the hand of God that promoted me at like three different levels. He promoted me to a place I never should have been. Okay. And it was amazing. And I'm so thankful um, for that. Um, but I'll say this, I got promoted to a sales position. Okay. Now I know if you see me in the pulpit and you're like, well, you know, you're fine to talk in front of people. Um, but talking in front of people is very different than selling things to people that they really don't need. Okay. And I was, again, I was 20, you know, I didn't have a clue what I was doing 21 at this point. And, uh, I remember just being so like paralyzed with fear because it was very much like I was dealing not with individuals. I was dealing with like corporations like Boeing and, you know, the biggest hospital in, in that area and different things like that felt totally underqualified. And I literally had a conversation with the Lord. I said, Father, I will be so faithful to do everything. This is what my manager, she says that if I will do these six things every single day that I should be successful. And Father, I'm going to do these six things and I am going to be so good at all of these things. But me doing those things does not guarantee that I will make sales. And so, Father, I am just asking you, we are going to be faithful in our tithing. We are going to be faithful in our giving. And I am going to be faithful to work hard. But, Lord, you're going to have to make up the difference because I am not a salesman, you know. And the Lord was like, I know, you know. But, but and, and so this is what happened. And I'm not saying this. I, I'm just, I'm saying this as a testimony. I mean, please understand, please understand the heart of what I'm trying to say. I am saying this as a testimony. As a 20, as a 21 year old man child, okay, with a young wife and a young daughter, in, in 10 months of sales, God, now this is the early 2000s. I brought in $73,000 that year in 2001, which is the equivalent today of like $150,000, right? And the only reason I say that is to say that God was so faithful to bless and to promote and to secure, but there was also my contribution towards that. Does that make sense? Like, like I, I was going to be a hard worker. I was going to be faithful. I wasn't going to take unnecessary days off. I was going to work my hours. I was going to do my job. And I was also going to honor him with the first and best right, of, of everything that I brought in. And as a result of that, he poured out his blessing in, in such an incredible way in my life. Now, I'll tell you this. The next year, I went into full-time ministry. And that year, I did not make $73,000. I made $24,000, okay? We were below the poverty line where we were living for years. For years, we lived below the poverty line. But here's my point. God blessed my family in very different ways in 2002, then he blessed my family in 2001. In 2001, it was, it was a huge like financial, financial, financial blessing. In 2002, it was a very different type of blessing that he brought into our lives. But again, I, I believe there was a partnership there with the Lord. And so I, I say all that to say this, that even if you don't feel like God is working in the way that you feel like he should be working, he's working, right? You, you just, just stay the course, be faithful. Test him in this, but remain humble and do your part. Number nine is finally this, is the tithe reveals God's faithfulness. Um, his faithfulness to you is reflected to other people. 
Okay, in other words, this is a testament to other people. This is what he says to the people of Israel. Once you turn back to me and you see me pour out your blessing, then all the nations will call you blessed because yours will be a delightful land. Right? So again, it's not about me. It's, it's not about my money and my income and all this kind of stuff. It's great when God blesses in those ways. And I thank God for every time he ha- has done but it, it's more than that. It's a partnership for his kingdom. It's a testament to people who don't even know Jesus. That, man, there is something on this person's life. There is a favor that rests on their life. And it, it, it deflects to other people who don't even know the Lord. And in some way, at least in their heart, even if they don't verbalize it, in some way, if they know that we are a Christian, they are recognizing that God's hand is on our lives. Okay? God has always desired his people to be distinct from the other nations. He has always desired it. This is why he gave his people a Sabbath day. This is why he gave his people circumcision. This is why he gives Christian believers baptism. And I believe part of the distinction he wants to bring about in the lives of modern day Christians is the overwhelming favor and blessing of those who are faithful to be generous into his kingdom. Okay? Now, very, very quickly... Um, Let me talk to you about four reasons there are people in modern times who who are kind of like anti this idea of tithing, okay? Like they would say, I've read the Bible and this is kind of my take on tithing, okay? Let me give you four reasons. Number one, they say that tithing was for the purposes to support the temple, the Levites, and the poor, okay, or widows and orphans, Okay. My response to that is that the tithe still continues to support the church, the pastors, and the poor, okay? Like, it it was a different system religiously then than it is today, but it kind of fulfills the same purpose, okay? Um, So I think that argument is null and void. Okay, number two, they say that the tithe was spoken of by Jesus, like when Jesus was living his life, but it was before the new covenant. Okay, so this is what they mean by that. As New Testament believers, there are certain things we are no longer bound to. There are certain laws we are no longer bound to. Okay, and that's true. That's emphatically true. Okay, and so what they're saying is that in New Testament Christianity, that we're no longer bound to the law, and maybe we're no longer bound to tithe, right? And so when a person says, well, but Jesus spoke about tithing and he affirmed tithing, which I'll talk about in a second, they would say, yeah, but that was before he went to the cross. So Jesus was still kind of living in the old covenant, okay? And my simple logical argument would be this. If you're going to take that train of thought, then that means that everything Jesus said before he went to the cross doesn't apply. I mean, that's just the logical conclusion, Okay, and so I don't think that argument holds any weight whatsoever. Number three, um, a person may say the tithe wasn't spoken of directly by Paul, and I would say that's absolutely true. Paul did not speak directly of the tithe, and Paul wrote most of the New Testament, Um, but Paul did focus on this concept of generosity and being a person with a giving spirit. Okay, so my estimation is that Paul would look at a tithe and say, oh, that's like, that's the starting block. Right? That's what I think Paul would say. I'm not saying he said it, but I, I, think if, I think I know Paul pretty well. I think he would say, yeah, the tithe is kind of the starting block and generosity should abound. Number four, they would say that the tithe is connected to the ceremonial laws. And again, therefore, we, we, they no longer apply to us. Okay? What I mean by that is this. In the Old Testament, there were 6,000 laws. Okay? Well, really, there were only 613 laws. Okay? But what the religious community did is they built 6,000 laws around those 600 laws. We called them fence laws because what they wanted to do, they loved God. And they said, look, God has given us 613 laws. Let's build all these other laws into place so we don't even get close to breaking those 613. Okay, so the motivation was right, but it was crazy. Okay, 600 laws, and they made 6,000 laws. Okay, well... 
out of those 613 laws, there are some of those laws that are ceremonial. They have to do with how you sacrifice an animal to God. That is Old Testament theology, okay? There were others that were civic laws, and they were saying like this, look, if somebody steals your ox, this is how you deal with it, okay? Now, we don't have ox today, so we, or I guess some people do. We, the average person in Columbia, South Carolina doesn't have an ox. You're not worried, and if you do, you're not worried about somebody stealing it, okay? I'm simply saying that there were civic laws that they had that absolutely just don't apply to us now. But then there are moral laws, the Ten Commandments, and you know things like against sexual immorality and standing for truth and all of these types of things. We are not bound by the ceremonial laws because we're no longer in a sacrificial system. We're no longer bound by the civic laws because we live in a totally different culture. Christ's blood has freed us from those laws, but we are still bound to the moral laws of, of the Old Testament, okay? And so uh, a person may say, uh, well, you know, the tithe was part of the ceremonial law because it had to do with the temple and the priest and all that. And, and I honestly, I would say absolutely, I, I think that that's true, okay? We no lo- and we no longer live under those ceremonial uh, laws and all this stuff. But I would simply say this. Even though we may not be bound, and, and I'll, be, I'll be honest and I'll say this, I, I, don't, I don't believe that we are bound to be people who tithe, okay? Now, I believe that I want to preserve the blessing of God over my life, so I'm going to tithe, and I do think on some level it's an issue of obedience. But if you want to camp in this ground and say, well, you know, it's not a moral law, so we really don't have to do that, I will concede that, okay? I'll say that that's fine. But I will also make the statement that there are some things in Scripture, Old Testament, that are not law, but they are good and godly principles that we are to live by, okay? And I believe that the tithe um, should not be connected back to a law. You guys, God does not want us to tithe because it's a law. He does not, that is not, he wants us to tithe to show his lordship, to show our love and our appreciation that we trust him. It is birthed from this place of love. And Paul, although he didn't specifically mention a tithe here, he was talking about giving and generosity. This is what he said. He said, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And this is the, the, the gist of it. Each person must give as he has decided in his own heart. Not reluctantly, not other compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what Paul is saying is this. He's saying, listen, if your motivation is bound up in the law or because some preacher made you feel guilty for not giving your money, then just don't give it. Because God wants you to give when it's birthed out of your soul, when it's birthed out of a place of love and obedience and uh, allegiance to him to say, Father, I treasure everything you've given me. And so therefore, I want to take my first fruit and I want to take my best fruit and I want to give it back to you. And I believe that you'll bless me as I do. So those are kind of the arguments against this idea of tithe. But I want to combat that. That's a bad word. I want to, um, I want to show you the other side, okay, of that and where I stand on these things. Uh, let me talk to you very, very quickly about five reasons I believe the tithe is still in play, okay? Number one is this. The tithe was not just Old Testament law. The tithe was pre-law. It came, the the first time we hear about the tithe is in the book of Genesis, okay? The Old Testament law didn't come into play until Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, okay? So hundreds of years later, maybe even thousand years later, All of that that stuff was later, but the first time we read about Abraham giving a tithe to a priest, it is found in the book of Genesis. So therefore, it's not just something that was, well, it originated with the Old Testament law. That's not true. It was incorporated in the New Testament law, but it was in play long before the Old Testament law began. So we believe it it was the design of God from the beginning. Number two is not only was it pre-law, but we also believe that the tithe was practiced in the Old Testament, okay? Um, Obviously, uh, the law, we all know that, okay? Number three is that we also believe that the tithe was encouraged in the book of Proverbs, okay? This is without question. I could read text to you, but my point is this in pointing that out. Proverbs is known as a book of wisdom, 
Okay, so when you read through the, the book of Proverbs, there are these general like like there are these general statements that say generally if you do this, this will be the outcome, right? Um, husbands, um, this is how you should treat your wife, right? Uh, young men, this is how you should treat your younger brother. Okay, so it's a book filled with wisdom about life and loving and all of these types of things. And two or three different times in the book of wisdom, it is affirmed that we should be people who honor God with our tithe. Okay, number four, when you jump to the New Testament, tithing was affirmed by Jesus. You remember he's in this conflict with the religious leaders. And he looked at him and he said, man, you guys, he said, you tithe off of everything, right? Not not only your paycheck, but you tithe when you pluck a little bit of mint from your garden, you take a tenth of it and you tithe it. You tithe off everything. And this is what he said. He said, and you should do that. He said, but also you should be merciful, right? Also, you should be kind and compassionate to other people. And so when Jesus said this, it was kind of a rebuke to the people. He was saying, look, you tithe, and, and you should tithe, but it's not just about tithing, right? You, you also got to have love in your heart, you know what I mean? But the point is, is that Jesus affirmed it, and he said, you tithe, and you should do that, right? So it's affirmed by Jesus as the Son of God. And number five, uh, I wrap up with, with simply saying this, that the tithe was also practiced by the early church, Okay, now when you begin to look at doctrine, when you begin to look at uh, Christian practices, what most theologians do, what good theologians do, is they oftentimes, they obviously start with the Bible to see what the text says, but then they go to the first two or three hundred years after scripture was written and they learn what the early church practiced, okay? Okay. How did they do water baptism? How did they do discipleship? How did they do all of these things? And what can we learn? And the reason they do that is because what they're trying to do, they're studying people that would have had interactions with the Apostle John. They would have known Peter. They would have known Paul. They would have known these people. So the freshness of Jesus as the Son of God, they would have been so much closer in history than we are today. And so good theologians go back and they say, what what did they do? What did they learn? How did they operate? And so what they did is in the in the early early church, this is like soon after Paul, is the church developed a document. It's called the Didache. Okay, you can look it up. I mean, you can download a PDF today if you wanted to. It's called the Didache. And basically what it is, is it's a handbook for churches. Okay, that was written like in year 100. Okay, and basically this is what they're saying. It goes through and it's just like a handbook. And it says, listen, when you meet together, here are the things that you should do. Okay, Um, when it talks about water baptism, uh, it opens up. I can't remember exactly. It says, look, go to a place with a, a lot of water. And if you can't find a place with a lot of water, go to a place that has a running stream. And if you can't have a place that has a running stream, then go to a well. And if you can't find a well, and it gives all these concessions for the order, like this is how you should do water baptism. So it's like this handbook for how to do these things. Super, super helpful. And there is an entire section dedicated here to tithing and offerings and uses the word tithing and offerings in the early church. And so my point is simply this, is that tithing and giving of offerings has been done since Genesis through today. And I believe that it has sustained that way because it has always been the plan of God to use the people of God to sustain the house of God. I believe that. So here is the bottom line of the bottom line for all of us, okay? And can I tell you, like, this is so sobering, but it's also, like, almost scary to me a little bit. The bottom line of the bottom line is this, is that every person on planet Earth tithes. Every person throughout human history who has ever lived tithes. They give their first and their best to somebody. 
Everybody tithes, but everybody doesn't tithe to the Lord. Some people tithe to MasterCard, and some people tithe to McDonald's. Some people tithe to their debt or to their phone bill or whatever the case is. But the point is simply this. Everybody tithes. Everybody takes their first 10% and they give it to somebody. And God is just simply saying this. Why don't you give it back to me because you wouldn't have it without me? That's a moment. That's a moment of sobriety. That's a moment of examining our own hearts. And I believe it ties into the simple statement that Jesus made in Matthew 6. He said this. He said, wherever your treasure is. In other words, wherever, wherever your money is, there your heart will be also. It's about money, but it's not about money. It's about the heart. It's about allegiance. It's about the lordship of Jesus. It's about me loving Jesus so much that his commandments for me are not burdensome. I do these things because he is my Lord, you know. And I want to encourage you tonight. I know I'm sitting in a room of a vast majority in this room are very mature in the Lord, okay? So um, you are probably bored from hearing me say all the stuff that you already know tonight. Um, but let me just remind you that as you're so faithful to give, um, make it an exercise not to just get in this systematic mechanical routine of just cutting a check or having auto pay. And I, I believe I do all that stuff. We have auto tithe and all that stuff. But I still want there to be moments where I mix my faith with my actions. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to mix. It's like I can come in here and sing the songs, but I want my faith to, to, to catch those words as they ascend the throne. And when I, when I give my tithe to the Lord, I don't want to just shell out money. That, that's not what this is about. I want to say, Father, I, I give this to you because I love you and because I believe you. Like, I believe that you're going to cover me. I believe that you're going to do for me. But I want, you to, I want to mix my faith with this, and I want to be conscious that who I'm giving this to and believing that you're going to do everything that you said you were going to do. That's what it's about. That's what tithing is about. Don't get it mixed up. Don't listen to all the people that say crazy stuff. Tithing ultimately comes back to the condition of the heart and our love and allegiance for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.